Hello and welcome to the Your Parenting Mojo podcast. Today we are going to talk about a topic that I know interests parents everywhere and that is sleep. And so we've already covered this on the show from the perspective of looking at cross-cultural ideas about sleep. But today we're here with an expert who is going to give us some practical ideas on how to get more sleep. And so Dr. Chris Winter is a board certified neurologist and a double board certified sleep specialist who's in private practice in Charlottesville, Virginia. He consults with athletes on improving their sleep and his first book the sleep solution why your sleep is broken and how to fix it was geared towards adults challenges with sleep and his new book just published in august is called the rested child why your tired wired and irritable child may have a sleep disorder and what to do about it so today we're going to talk about sleep for children sleep for adults sleep for everybody welcome chris it's great to have you here thank you so much for having me it's, a, it's an honor so um, I would like to start by addressing the elephants in the room, because I know that uh, parents who are listening to this want to know your stance on these topics because they want to know, is this person's approach aligned with things that I believe about sleep and about raising my children and about my values and beliefs? So bed sharing. <laughs> um, I, I will say that uh, I found your approach in the book to be a little bit flippant. And I'm, I'll quote, you said, we used to sleep piled on top of one another in a cave, I suppose, but we also used to banish people with leprosy and smoke cigarettes in operating rooms. We evolve. And that to me sort of implies that only backwards people in backwards countries who haven't yet seen the light in the sort of Western educated, industrialized, rich democratic approach to sleep, they're, they're just, uh, you know, our approach is clearly superior and they're missing out on some important development um, when actually I know the research has shown that uh, people who live in those countries you ask them about their children's sleep problems and they're like what sleep problems so um, so, <laughs> so tell me more about your uh, stance on bed sharing and where that came from and, and what you believe about it. Sure so I think it's important to define evolve um, because you're putting a judgment on it when in fact evolve just means take something that's simple and make it more complicated. Mm. And we do that very well in this country. Um, I used to be able to fix my own car. I cannot do that anymore because mm -hmm. the cars have evolved to the point now where um, it doesn't allow that to happen. So I do think that sleep was very simple in the past and it's become very complicated. Um, people did sleep in one room at some point in the past and now you have a nice house in Gwinnett County you know, Atlanta and every, every one of your seven kids has their own bedroom and their own situation. So I don't, I'm not here to pass judgment on anything. My, my stance on co-sleeping is you do what's right for your family and your children. Uh, I don't really have an opinion on it one way or the other. Outside of two things, one, I do think that it is important to be careful with little children when you sleep with them, just out of a, a danger perspective. And I don't think that's particularly radical, although I do think it took a while for the American Academy of Pediatrics to really come out with a position on it just because of this kind of you know, feelings about it. It's deeply personal to people, the way they sleep. So I personally believe that it's probably not a great idea to sleep in a bed with a child under the age of one. Mm -hmm. um, just because, you know, I think that we have seen bad outcomes. I've seen, I think as of today, 32,233 people in my clinic, four of them have had issues where children have perished in the night because a family member rolled on top of them. That's a very, very, very small percentage, um, far less than what, you know, would be quoted for SIDS. So to me, if a parent understands that, and it's very important to them to, to take that risk, I, I'm not really here to judge that. Um, I can say that of the people that we spoke to when that happened, including a family member of somebody who works for me, it was deeply traumatic and something that they never wanted to repeat again. Um, I think that's different, though, than a family bed or co-sleeping. I mean, I think that's a very different situation. Um, the other bias that I have is that of those 32,000 people that have come to my clinic, I have yet to encounter somebody who says, I'm sleeping with all four of my children and it's going great. I just wondered if you give me some tips on how to make it even better. <laughs> the vast majority of people that we're seeing are sort of the opposite. It's like, help us to make the situation that we've chosen, which is to not have a child in bed with us more functional and better. Um, so I, I, I'm here to support anybody. I think that the people who are co-sleeping and doing well with it um, don't really have to see me or buy the book. Yeah, in there's fact, some flexibility there. Be, yeah, I know. <laughs> and I think co-sleeping can be really helpful because 
when you look at some of the disorders of sleep that we talk about in the book, there's sort of a mystery to the parent or parents that aren't with their children until they share the hotel room, until they go to grandmother's house and share a bed because grandma only has one spare bedroom where they're like, dear God, my child does this thing at night. We had no idea. So, you know, even if you're somebody who believes not, you know, not in co-sleeping, it might not be a bad idea once a month to kind of check in. <laughs> like we're all sleeping together to make sure we're not harboring bad sleep problems. And um, so anyway, I think, it, and then the, other, the only other thing I would say that again, there's a selection bias here too, is that when kids come to have sleep studies, a parent we make a parent accompany them. And so our sleep center is in a hotel. So it's very comfortable. The, the child has a bed and the parent has a bed in this you know, hotel. It's a truly, it's a Hilton hotel. Um, it's amazing how many times the parent is the one diagnosed with the sleep problem. The tech will say the kid's okay. Dad you know, is suffocating 38 times an hour kind of thing. So I do sometimes wonder if you know, if you're going to co-sleep, it might be a good idea to make sure your sleep is really healthy and, and positive before you subject your child to it. But that, that's, a, that's a small percentage, probably. Yeah. Okay, cool. Well, thanks for clarifying that. And um, I, I guess my, my stance on co-sleeping has always been, uh, I, I don't believe it's co-sleeping itself that's necessarily dangerous. It's, it's co-sleeping in the way that we tend to do it in this country, uh, on, a soft, on a soft bed with duvets and pillows and, and above the, the level of the floor. So the child could potentially roll off the bed. It, it, there, there is some potential danger of rolling onto the child but my hypothesis based on the research that I have read is that um, that that the danger of that happening is is much less than the danger of the child suffocating from a pillow or from uh, getting a duvet on them or rolling off the bed or something else happening that's based on the practices that we use when we sleep and that if we didn't use those practices if we use practices that are more like the practices used where uh, people uh, do co-sleep routinely then chances are it would be much much less dangerous do you agree with that perspective yeah that's probably very true okay. um you know, a lot of the things that we talk about in terms of having bumpers and cribs and soft pillows and stuffed animals, you know, really having a hard surface and a simple surface yeah. and, you know, just and, and creating things that make you as the parent comfortable. I and mean, we co-slept with our kids. They were just in a little bassinet, kind of like you described next to our bed, just because I not interested in sleeping on the floor, even though it might be better. Um, and I know from experience that, you know, my wife would sometimes say, it's truly disturbing how deep, deeply you sleep sometimes because, you know, she's been screaming for 30 minutes and you haven't moved um, to the point where when I was in residency, my wife would not let me be at home with the kids while I was sleeping unless I was sleeping literally on the floor, as you mm -hmm. said, in the nursery away from them so they could like throw stuff out of the nursery onto my head to wake me up just because, I was, I, I was always even just kind of on a couch, which is the worst place you're sitting there watching TV and you kind of drift off with them on your stomach. Like yeah. I was always off. very paranoid about that. Yeah. Absolutely. Yeah. 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 Um, yeah. I can, but I would agree with everything that you said. Okay. I can fully empathize with your wife too. <laughs> yeah. I mean, she, she really feels like, I mean, I probably shouldn't announce this, but if people came into the house unannounced at night, I would be no help in terms of dealing with the situation. I'm not sure what she thinks I could do in that situation, but <laughs> might be better to sleep through it. I don't know. I'm not yeah, sure about maybe, that. Maybe. <laughs> and then you do sort of casually toss out this idea that if we start out co-sleeping, then children are going to refuse to sleep on their own later. And you, you have this little footnote that says, sweetie, can you take your laptop somewhere else to do your calculus homework? Daddy and I need to sleep. Um, and, and I have this, this statistic that quotes a paper that uh, research suggests co-sleeping children slept fewer hours, had more sleep disturbances and bedtime resistance more behavioral and emotional problems than independent sleepers. But that study involved school-age children um, and also found that the anxiety and nighttime fears predicted co-sleeping rather than the co-sleeping was generating anxiety and fears. Um, so it, it seemed as, to me as though it was unlikely that the co-sleeping was going to cause behavioral and emotional problems, which is what I understood when I was reading that in your book. What, what do you think about that? I don't think it causes it. Again, it's just a matter of what does the parent want? And most parents are probably not letting those. It's sort of like, I don't know. I remember having a conversation with my parents when they said, you're too old for a blanket. I have no idea why they chose that particular Tuesday to 
just take it away from me. My guess is at some point I would have not been that interested in the blanket. We never told our kids stop. We call them booze. Okay. No more booze because you're this particular age. So again, I, I think the footnote was more in line with at some point parents are like, we don't want to let this sort of play out naturally. I have no doubt in my mind that it always does. I mean, I, I've never met a family said he's 17, he's still in the bed with us. And, you know, we really are just losing our patience. So to me, that's more about at some point, most co-sleeping families that are coming to see us have decided we're, we're done with it. It's affecting our intimacy. We want to have some time by ourselves at the end of the night that don't involve the kids in the bed with us. I had an NBA player that had two children in bed, one with the bed every th third or fourth night. And he was like, this is affecting my career because I'm having to get up and change you know, sheets every night. And my wife is like, that's okay, because this is what we're going to do. So again, I, these are probably true. It's just, I think it's hard to find some parents with the courage to let it play out um they they kind of want their 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 lives back and 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 to your point that's a big problem when it comes to sleep i mean most one of my mentors said you know most kids sleep problems are parents sleep problems and it's an expectation that we have of our kid that's not meeting our needs. I've got a lot of work to do and I'm, by, I'm falling behind and watching episodes of White Lotus. So I got to get this kid in her bed so I can do what I need to do. If your expectation is eh, they can be in bed with me, they might sleep, they might not. Everything, even adult sleep gets better. So a lot of what we're managing is not, that's why you said, what is your stance on sleep training? I love that term. As if we're doing like, the parents that didn't train their kids to sleep and now they can't, you know what I mean? It's, it's not swimming for God's sakes. Like <laughs> they're going to sleep. They may, they may sleep differently than what you would expect or on a different schedule, but the idea that we're training them, no, we're just kind of guiding some little parameters here and there. You know, so it's, it's interesting the way we think about these things. Kids are good sleepers and good eaters and good breathers and good drinkers. Like we just kind of need to, step back and, and let it happen and be on the lookout for problems in those areas. But our dominion over the situation, I think, is a lot less than what we think it is. Yeah. And and I, I, I want to sort of translate what you're saying into language that I think will be familiar to people who are longtime listeners of the show. We're really talking about needs here. And if the, per the parent's need is being met and the child's need, need is being met by whatever situation you're sleeping in, then you really don't have a sleep problem. <laughs> Even That's if, right. Um, or, or, any, or any problem. Yeah. I don't want to stay out late. Well, we don't want you to stay out late. There, we don't have a problem if you're staying out. You know what I mean? Like, <laughs> yeah. you're absolutely Absolutely right. And, and that balance is important, but I think it should always bend towards the child, you know, in, in my opinion. I mean, mm -hmm. not to the point where you're hurting relationships and, right. and upsetting people, but, you know, sometimes a child's needs are just, they supersede that. And if, if you don't like that, that's okay. Maybe children aren't your thing. That's, <laughs> that's fine. That's, that's okay. Yeah. Okay. All right. So you touched on sleep training. Um, and so uh, specifically on the method of, of crying it out, uh, where you train a child to stop calling out in the night by not going into your room. And I was really pleased to hear you distinguish between what you called a gentle weep and that hysterical hyperventilating scream with purple face and bulging forehead vein that happens when a kid's really hurt or upset. Because sure. I think it is really important to distinguish between those two things. And and maybe parents who are expecting or they have a newborn, they're, they're still learning learning how to do that um, and, and may not yet realize that there actually are many different kinds of cries and you can distinguish between them. And so you say, trust your instincts. You are going to know when to intervene. But then in the very next sentence, you said you need to pick a time interval that you'll wait before going back into the room to console the child. And so I'm just trying to figure out how did those two things fit together in terms of what we're actually doing when a child is having trouble getting to sleep? Well, to me, it's sort of that, again, that set point that even if the child was just kind of gently weeping or calling out, you know, or something that I wanted to have some sort of guideline in my mind. I mean, again, I'll go in every 30 seconds if we need to do that. So to me, it's just kind of a matter of, you know, he's in a place where he's okay, but he's kind of upset. We've got that feeling of it's not that hyperventilation or he's thrown up in his bed and his face down in it. And could I push it another 20 seconds just to kind of stretch that out a little bit, but sometimes you can't. So to me, it's just more of a, not only a guideline of what to do, but a guideline, hopefully that allows a parent to say, you know what, when we started this, 
we were we 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 couldn't even start the clock before because he was so upset by the time we walked out. And now he's routinely going probably 10 or 20 minutes before that happens. It doesn't sound like much, but it's there. And I just think that when the kid is little and 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 those things are kind of being being done, it, it Again, there's that expectation. If you're kind of like, I have no nothing, no nothing planned tonight. It's like there's a great mad about you episode that they kind of did that. Helen Hunt and Paul Reiser. It was all shot in one take. And they were kind of sitting outside waiting for her to make those little sounds. And they were kind of talking. It was just a really cute little episode. Um, but I think when you kind of have set it up that we're gonna have a night where we're just going in and out of this bedroom. And you know maybe we could answer an email or plan out something for some you know but but this is what we're going to do. I think things go much better. So, you know, it's just a it's a rough guideline. I wouldn't say well he's screaming, but we still have forty five seconds left. No, I think you should go in there and, and do it. And and the more you do it up front, the probably the quicker it's going to happen because you're going to understand that you're always there. Um, you're you're never far away. And and you know, and again, if somebody says, I don't really want to do that, I'd rather just have the baby in bed with me and never even experience this purple bulging vein thing. Again, that's fine. If if that's that's what you need and 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 that's what you want, that's that's great. You may never hear it, you know, but I just I remember those days very clearly if it would kind of start off with this kind of like ah, and you're like, and sometimes it would go away and that would be that. Yeah. And other times it would just kind of build. And, and yeah, I think it's better actually to intercept early because when they get really upset and wound up, that can interfere with sleep. Just the anxiety and cortisol yeah. of all that situation can make it harder on yourself. So probably better just to jump in there early. Yeah. And, and I think the really, the key part is, is having expectations that are aligned with what your child can actually do. Some, some children are going to go to sleep oh. by themselves in their room. Fine. And other children are not going to be able to do that. And if your expectation is that your child will be able to do that and your child actually isn't capable of doing that, then those misaligned expectations are going to set you up for a Absolutely. whole world of pain. <laughs> yeah. And just, and, and, I mean, I, I was, talking about that at a lecture recently. I mean, one of my worst parenting moments was that situation. I, my second child was born when I was in residency and I was just, I was not in a healthy place and not getting enough sleep. And I was like, oh, you go do something. I'll take care of him. We're just going to take a nap together. And he was in his bassinet safe. I'm not going to roll onto him. And, and he just was not going to sleep. And I remember getting home when my wife got home, I said, he's an idiot. They're just, I, mean, I, I just, and we looked at each other and I was like, I can't believe I just said that about our child. He's this poor little six month old or whatever. But I just think that, again, it was just such a terrible misalignment of what I needed and what I expected, yeah. you know, versus what he could actually do. He wasn't doing anything wrong. He's not an idiot. He just wasn't ready to sleep in that moment for whatever reason. And, and that, that problem is a parent problem, not a child problem. Yeah, for sure. Okay, cool. Well, thank you for clarifying that. And I think that oh, sure. yeah. most people who are listening and watching can kind of exhale and, and say, okay, yes, I'm, I'm on board with this. And now I can relax into the rest of this now that I, I see that we're somewhat aligned <laughs> here. So thank you for that. Um, so, sure. so let's, let's start to go through some of the main ideas in the book. And, and you talk about the amount of sleep that people need at different ages and how this varies. Um, and I think the, the way that we often think about it isn't terribly helpful. <laughs> so um, what would you tell us about the, uh, the amount of sleep that we need at different ages and, and what should we understand about that? Yeah, I think that Western medicine doesn't do a great job of differentiating you from an average. Mm -hmm. You know, we, we, that's kind of what we learn. Okay, the average person has a gallbladder underneath their liver on this side of their body. Well, there's people who have their liver on their other side of their body. Doesn't make them wrong or right, just a little bit different. So if you always, if you think, well, 100% of people have their liver on that side of their body, you're going to make a big mistake at some point coming up. So, you know, I think that with, with, with sleep, we do that very poorly. And I, and I think it comes from the fact that we have a lot of interest in sleep but the magazine only has about 350 words for that article. So what's so great about podcasts and, and I, I would this is back behind the scenes of your very viewers. Like we were having some back and forth in the emails. Like, I don't know if I want to have you on my show because <laughs> I'm concerned about your, and I was like, this is so great. Like she's got an opinion. 
we're going to get into this. Like, it's not just you're great and you've got two board certifications, which is kind of a joke, but that's it's not a funny one. But anyway, yeah, that, there's more um, on that in the book. <laughs> yeah. So but but, you know, so you know, the challenging of certain things and sharing and ideas is what makes a podcast so great versus, you know, a writer who writes up and God knows they're just doing their job. Yeah. How much sleep should a kid get? And you can tell they don't really want to talk about it. I just need you to tell me real quick so I can write this little 350 word thing for this magazine I write for, which is nothing wrong with that. But I often find myself sort of incapable of answering a question. So sleep needs a tough one because number one, it's changing all the time, even in us. And if you look at like the National Sleep Foundation's, you know, chart on sleep average, you see from the time they're born until you're, you know, senior citizen, get the early bird special at the cafeteria. It's like this constant reduction in sleep. And there's a lot of debate. Is that normal? What accounts for that? You know, what, what makes that happen? You know, we know growth hormone is secreted primarily in deep sleep. Deep sleep is sort of that driver of the diminishment. We have about the same light sleep and REM sleep as we go through our life, but that deep sleep is diminishing and it makes kids grow. It makes us healthy. It's probably a big reason why we age as we get older. Um, but in addition, if you just look at one particular age category, category, you know, the infants are the one that fascinate me because there can be an eight hour difference between my child of that age group and yours, which is why parents should never talk to other parents who have children. Like it should be not allowed. Like you're not allowed to compare your sleep or ever talk about that. It's like talking about your kid's SAT score. You would never do that with another parent. Why would you talk about their sleep? You know, so those things are so individualized and what starts to happen is that we start to worry when we have children on that shorter end because of everything you've just said. It's expectation. I, my expectation is that the Ryan Reynolds, Blake Lively book on sleeping kids, their kid is beautiful, sleeps 14 hours a night. So I'm going to set my schedule up to make my child sleep 14 hours. And it doesn't work because nobody ever asked the question, well, does my child specifically need that. And we do a good job of talking about that. I think maybe with food, I've never seen an article that says how many calories would she be eating? Because I think there's an insinuation that, well, what do you do? Well, I'm a long distance runner and I'm five foot one, or I'm a bodybuilder and I'm six, six, or I'm, an, I'm a senior citizen and I'm a 18 year old. Like, so those caloric needs can change radically depending on circumstances and genetics but we don't seem to want to talk about that with sleep. It's always just give me a number, eight hours. We got to get eight hours. Well, that's great if you're in that normal distribution, but if you're on those tails, that's a, that's a real problem. So I think that, you know, understanding how can we look at our individual child or children and figure out what is their individual needs for sleep and know that once you've got it figured out now in a couple of years, it's going to change. So just be ready and, 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 and understand that, but it's not hard if you kind of come to it with a sense of openness and, and questioning. And there's a lot of cool technology that, you know, Again, I'm, 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 I'm plus minus about technology too, but there are some cool things out there that can allow a parent to be pretty scientific about figuring out how much sleep their kid needs. So then once you've got that number, you can kind of construct the schedule that works best for you and your family that also meets the needs of the children. So like you said, that equality, what I need, what the child needs kind of meets perfectly. Yeah. Okay. So we're going to talk about how you get to that number in, in a little bit. Firstly, I just want to acknowledge uh, something I learned from this uh, during the research for this episode, which is around 9% of individuals may sleep less than fewer than six hours a night. Um, although that was based on some survey data that had sort of methodological challenges, but, but approximately, um, and, and, and uh, they were only looking at adults as well, not children. So, um, so I think that we, we don't necessarily allow for the fact that our child might be one of those people and in both of your books I think you talk about uh how this can be hereditary <laughs> yeah absolutely it's one of my favorite things to ask parents because not only in terms of duration I don't want to jump ahead but not only in terms of duration but mm -hmm. timing preferences yeah which is a big thing too and it's so fascinating to say you know what did your parents your biological parents do for a living or what do they do and you know we see a lot of uh, mom's a trauma surgeon and dad is, you know, something in the military or a lawyer or something. And, and you're like, okay, well, I bet trauma surgeons don't sleep a whole lot. And maybe your daughter has kind of fallen 
on that side of things. And so it's really interesting um, and there's nothing wrong or right about it. It can have some real advantages. Now, if your daughter wants to be a trauma surgeon, like mom was a trauma surgeon, she might have an advantage there in terms of, it's not an intelligence thing. It's just, can you deal with being, you know, God, I, I didn't want anything to do with that, but I'm glad somebody does. And that might give her a, a sense of being able to do that better. Uh, but it does come some downsides as well, too, especially if you're reading books that say you better get eight or nine hours of sleep or you'll de develop dementia or heart disease. It can put people and especially kids under a strange pressure to deliver something they're not really capable of doing. Yeah. Yeah. And, and I think that also coming from that pressure is this uh, the sleep identity that you talk about where we we adults, we parents project these ideas of our child being a bad sleeper onto them. And so often we see in so many aspects of behavior that you, you think of your child as being the bad child or the, the difficult child and they fulfill that prophecy. <laughs> and yeah. So I was really interested to see the same concept come up in the idea of sleep. Well, I was interested in your, I mean, just in terms of your background, I find it interesting the way we describe our children that there's certain things that are sort of off limits that I, you know, I've never heard a parent say, oh, come down here, Teddy. Teddy's our dumb child. Do you know what I mean? Like, even if Teddy struggles, you would never describe him in that. In fact, there's often a, 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 an effort to accentuate the things that Teddy, Teddy's a great communicator. Um, you know, he just can't do complex math or whatever it is. Like, but it's interesting to me how sleep seems to be something that parents are almost describing like hair color. This is our child. He's blonde. This child has got darker, more wavy hair, bad sleeper, good sleeper, almost as if you're just describing a trait. Mm -hmm. Oh, there's no judgment there. He's just a bad sleeper where, you know, the way kids internalize that is so important. And I see adults too, just to let your viewers know that, and it's really fascinating to see all ages related to sleep. So I just see sleep patients in my clinic and how many older people will talk about how bad they've slept for so long. You know, I've always been a bad sleeper is kind of the thing. And it's always interesting to ask what have, what has led you to that met that determination. Mm -hmm. You know, I'm a bad basketball player. And if you ask me why I'm, I'm short and I don't handle the ball, I can give you very objective things that I doubt you'd be able to argue me out of that assessment. But the sleep thing is it's fascinating sometimes where those things come from that have no real grounding, anything particularly real. Um, and, and if you and, and based upon the things that you do, I'm sure the way we view ourselves like that identity can sometimes be more impactful to our day-to-day -day functionality than the sleep itself. Mm -hmm. Like, and I always divide people into good sleepers, you know, the way they think about their sleep, good and bad, but the way they really are good or bad. So you can have people who are really good sleepers who know they are, they're impossible. The people who are terrible sleepers who know they're terrible, but then you also have terrible sleepers that think they're great. You know, the trauma surge, as long as I get two hours, I'm fine. No, you're not. That's not a true state. Like you're going to die at 52 if you don't do something. And then you've also got people who are terrible sleepers who are actually pretty good. There's nothing wrong with it, but they believe that. And it really is pretty damaging. Yeah. Okay. Um, and so I think um, it, it seems as though one uh, one underutilized tool in understanding children's sleep is, is really accurate journaling, right? In, instead of just uh, thinking, oh, my kid's a bad sleeper because they woke up again. And you talk in the book about how uh, we're sort of, our, our minds are predisposed to remember the one time this week that they did wake up uh, yep. rather than the three other times that they didn't wake up. Um, and, and that journaling can actually be really helpful to understand what's really going on instead of just the, the parts that really stick out to us because we didn't want them to happen. Yeah. They're important not only for the parent, but also for the child. Do you know what I mean? Like, to, yeah. so, so that you're sort of putting a stop to their, oh, I'm just so bad. Well, look, you know, if you compare to January, you had seven nights out of that month where you really struggled. This month and last month, it's only been two and three. That's a huge improvement. You know, so always kind of be encouraging or 
it's going the wrong direction, in which case at some point you might decide, well, we might need a little bit of help here because we think there might be something going on. So I think that the journaling is very important. And, you know, re, we, you talked about selection bias earlier, which is, you know, sleep research tends to be kind of fraught with it doesn't mean you can't get a lot of cool information about it, but we always want to look at it with that eye but that selection bias is always important in terms of you know if i have one bad night in a month i'll not mention it at the dinner party how's you been sleeping oh, i've been sleeping great this month you know maybe if my wife were there well you slept pretty badly last week that tuesday when something happened oh yeah i guess you're right so it can work both ways too that you know uh uh, I often feel like my bias is, oh, I get eight hours of sleep every night. And my sleep's great. And my wife is like laughing in the back. She's not here right now. So I can say whatever I want to say about my sleep. But, mm -hmm. you know, sometimes that technology or the journal is wonderful to kind of say, you know what, what I'm thinking as being the exception is kind of becoming my rule. I need to be smarter about that. And I think that's important for older kids. Mm -hmm. You know, yes, you're going to have a soccer game or a test or a choir rehearsal or a you know, volunteering at some soup kitchen or something. We want to make sure those are exceptional nights and not becoming a more normal night. Yeah. Okay. Um, and how does napping relate to all of this? Should, yeah. should we nap? How should we nap? Should children nap? How should children nap? <laughs> yeah. And I love talking about napping. Napping probably is sort of like we're deviating outside of I think of everything in terms of, of evidence as a spectrum. I'm pretty sure plants use chlorophyll to make, ox make oxygen from carbon dioxide. I, I'm not sure about these things over here. Napping, I, I'm pretty certain that, that it's a good thing. I think we have to be careful. Now I'm talking about napping in older kids and little kids. I think it's essential, um, you know, and in terms of when they drop their naps and how you structure that. Um, I've got ideas, you know, for people who are trying to figure that out, but there's no real right or wrong way to do it. I do think naps that are consistent are better, uh, meaning that it's something that the child can predict versus we're just going to try to fit an hour long nap in at some point. Now, that might be the case when your schedule doesn't allow for it. But I think if you could choose, Chris, which would you rather us do, a nap whenever we want to or a nap at a scheduled time, it's probably better scheduled. I mean, meal times being scheduled, some exercise time, a nocturnal sleep at night. We just know that those sort of zeitgebers really help to influence a child's circadian rhythm. And we can extrapolate from research as they get older, people who don't really develop that or have jobs that are pushing them outside of a consistent circadian rhythm. I work 7A to 7P in the emergency room then flip over to 7P, 7A two weeks later, might be a carcinogen. I mean, mm -hmm. our bodies don't like not understanding what's coming. Yeah. Um, outside of that, I think that napping is also an important tool for when a child has had inadequate sleep. There's been a research, re recent research study that says napping is inadequate to make up for sleep deprivation. I thought the interpretation of that study was a little bit skewed in the sense that, yes, if you're truly, really sleep depriving yourself, a 20 minute nap may not fully make up for the situation that you've created for yourself. But to me, it's kind of like if you're starving and you come across a cracker, should you eat it? The research would probably say this does not make up for the starvation, but I'd say probably eat the cracker because maybe you'll find another one in a few minutes. Like, you know, to me, like take what you can get. So to me, sometimes I think about napping in terms of we want to be careful about napping when a child or an adult is inefficient with sleep, mm -hmm. meaning that you know, an adult says it took me four hours to fall asleep last night. So I woke up, went to work, came home and took a four hour nap. I think that could facilitate a problem not going away. Now your body's kind of understanding that we're kind of all over the place with it. So to me, napping can be a wonderful way to make up for, for lost sleep. I mean, I think it's, it's perfectly adequate to look at sort of sleep debt data and say, my child needs not so much 10 hours a day, but maybe 70 hours a week. Mm -hmm. So if, a, you know, you go stay at grandma's house and she's got weird hours and something screws up your sleep and you get home, the child had a bad night of sleep. Grandma had friends over, so she didn't get two of her naps that you have the next six days to kind of maybe tweak some things, extend the naps to maybe make up for that sleep loss that really wasn't your fault. I think napping is very important in that way for kids and adults to kind of keep tra taps on you know, sleep debt because we're, we're not going to have a perfect night of sleep every night. It's just not going to happen.
Yeah. Okay. And then of course that begs the inevitable question. Uh, what happens when the child resists napping <laughs> and you can see that they're so tired and they just don't want to do yeah. it. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. And, that, and that's a really important concept of the fact that children manifest sleep very differently than adults do. You know, one of the reasons I called the book The Rested Child was because I don't think we talk about rest and meditation and relaxation and quiet time enough. It's sort of we, we judge success or failure in bed by speed of unconsciousness. Like that's the only thing that's good. Do you know what I mean? And and so I, I think that that if a child is resisting napping, there's a lot of questions to answer. Number one, is he always or she always resisting it? Meaning that it's time to drop the third nap because you know three percent of the time she's she's utilizing it's ninety seven she's not. Um, so that, I think that's important because I think those little things often give us a little window into, oh, I think that things might be evolving. You know, she was a 16 hour kid. Maybe she's more of a 15 hour kid now. Um, I think that's number one. Number two, I don't mind a child resisting a nap. I think the dialogue we want to have with the child is it's okay not to sleep. Like we never talked about sleep being something that had to happen with our children in fact we tried to avoid the topic altogether and you know why don't you just read a book or draw me a picture because we saw that cool fire truck why don't you see if you can draw how much you could draw from memory so we always kind of couched it as rest time or quiet time and then we would say if you fall asleep that's fine but if you don't you're still doing something really wonderful for your body and you're giving everybody a chance just to kind of be still and be quiet just for a little bit because that helps me to be a better parent for you it helps mm -hmm. us to be more healthy so trying to de-stress that beginning and give a child a little bit of freedom if, if they can understand it to to not sleep that's that's perfectly okay mm -hmm. you know and, and so in fact we would often say that you know i can't sleep like don't i don't want you to why don't you just read a comic book all night and maybe you could write an essay about it. when your parent when you have to write a paragraph for your you could write your paragraph about what it's like to stay up all night reading comic books and i remember our kids would be like really like, you, know, you don't care like no i don't really now we'll wake you up and you know we'll go about our day but we really tried to create a sense of there's no pressure here in fact you could not sleep if you tried like that's not something that you really find in nature so let's not complicate it by a lot of performance anxiety yeah, you know, yeah. I don't want to lie to a kid that it's not important. So it's that parenting mojo of I need to make sure you understand sleep is important and money is important and school is important, but it's not some sort of crisis if that thing if you get a C on a pay it's okay like it doesn't matter like so where can you find that balance of value sleep but understand it doesn't always work perfectly. Mm -hmm. That's a tough yeah. thing for everybody, myself included, to kind of figure out, you know. Yeah. And and I I really believe that the earlier that starts, the better we all are. Yes. And, and we have practiced what we call no set bedtime uh, since my daughter was probably three. Um, oh, and, really? Oh, yeah. Yeah. She she does not have a set bedtime. We read stories at eight o'clock and uh, we brush her teeth right after that. And then she decides her own bedtime. She tells us when she's tired. Um, and she is, we're homeschooling right now. So she doesn't have a set wake time, but she was in, in daycare and preschool for a long time. Yeah. And yeah, there were, there was a period of time where she would go to bed at 10 o'clock, 10 30. No, you sure you're not tired. And, and that lasted a few days and within a week or two, she's self-regulating her in bedtime. Oh, and I, I think, think that's awesome. Yeah. And, and so I, I was, I was pleased to read in, <laughs> in your book. We, we, we right. started around six or seven and I thought we were radical with that. <laughs> so that, that's amazing. Yeah. Um, but I think um, that's exactly what should happen. It's, it, there was a great study one time the kids were taken into a cafeteria with every kind of food uh, you know, available to them, including desserts. You know, for the first three days, they just ate cake. Yeah. And then they kind of regulated themselves. So I yeah. think we don't give kids credit for doing it and just having that sort of situation of, oh, your body knows what to do. Yeah. 
Yeah, that's so interesting that you bring up that the food issue because there is so much research on uh, ma- they call it uh, making the the vegetables the gateway food. You have to eat the vegetables as the gateway food to get to the dessert that you really want. And so, of course, if if we're saying you have to go to bed now, what does the child want more than anything? The child wants to stay up. <laughs> and yep. so, if you just take that away, you're just we we talk a lot on the show about dropping the rope. You're going to drop your end of the rope, and the the child there's nothing to pull on. They can pull their other end, but there's nothing to pull against. And so it's like. Okay, you want to stay up? That's fine. Yeah. <laughs> and yes, you're no, probably absolutely. You want to, you want to see me answer voice. emails? You can sit right there and watch me do it until I go to bed if you'd like. And, yeah. you know, it's, <laughs> it is interesting. It's a very, I, I don't know if it would, I don't know what your three year old was like, but for a six year old, it was a fun conversation. Mm-hmm. Like it was just, you can have all the candy you want. <laughs> we're, we're, we've got a truck pulling up right now, it's full of candy. <laughs> And we're going to dump it in a room and you just get it whenever like it was that kind of, yeah. we're going to have Christmas every day. Cause it's yeah. so much fun. Like it I was mean, just <laughs> that kind of like, are you kidding me? Like they just had yeah. this look like, this is great. Like this is the, and then it just kind of takes the whole, and I bet there's a lot of things that we could do with our kids that would remove those kinds of, of mystiques and, and yeah. weirdness that develops around it because we create it. Yeah. Yeah. And, and I think the, the important part is that yes, you're, you're removing the staying up as being the Holy grail of the thing that I want to do because you don't want me to do it. Um, and what you're also doing is you're, you're not just saying, well, okay, then you can have free for all in the house. Um, we, we, we are saying is I have needs too, and I have a need for quiet time. And here are some ways I can think of to meet yep. my need for quiet time. And, uh, you can meet your need as long as I can also meet my need. Yeah. So it, it's not and, just in the, the conversation like you said starting with a three-year-old but how important sleep is and how sleep reaches into so much about what you do things that a three-year-old could easily understand that those are not mutually exclusive Mm -hmm. i'm just giving you i mean i think lunch is important you may not be hungry for your sandwich right now don't eat it i don't care yeah i still think eating is important and eating the right food so you can have those two conversations in a way that are not mutually exclusive. We're just giving you the freedom and the space to recognize sleep when it's time for you to get it in a healthy way versus 11 o'clock, nine o'clock, seven o'clock. I mean, the number of adults that come to me who say, it takes me two hours to fall asleep. My first question is, why have you decided X is your bedtime? Mm -hmm. And they have no answer to it, probably because that foundational piece of learning how to sleep was never discussed. It was yeah. just dad told me I needed to go to bed at this time. And if he caught me in bed with the flashlight and a book, I'd get in trouble. Yeah. So I guess I go to bed at this time all the time. And I've never, never questioned it. Mm-hmm. Even when your body is saying, I don't want to go to bed at nine o'clock. It's taking me a, hear what I'm saying. Eleven's mm-hmm. much better for us. Like they don't, it doesn't resonate because I don't think they've ever had that conversation or that freedom to kind of choose that, which is yeah. a huge weight off a child. Yeah. Okay. Really so, is. so I, I mean, obviously I know, cause I've read the book, but uh, we can sort of tell where we're going with this conversation, medication for children uh, and, and having sleep problems. My guess is you're going to say not ever without talking to a sleep specialist first. Um, what, what would you yeah. advise? Yeah, parents I mean, who's killed children are not sleeping as much as they think they, their child actually right. needs. Yes. I mean, I don't use a lot of sleep aids. I I don't think they make a lot of sense. Not not only just fundamentally, but if you actually look at the research, it's extremely, you'd wonder how does this drug ever get approved for that because there's nothing here. And so, and more than that, you're having this beautiful conversation with your three-year-old. There is an assumed conversation with a melatonin gummy bear, which is, your brain is just not good at sleeping. So I'm going to give you something to make you good at it. And I, I, no, I'm not really fit. Now, if your child has narcolepsy, if your child has restless leg syndrome, your child has nocturnal reflux or asthma, of course, because we've created a diagnosis here that might have a medication that could improve that. The problem we often have with using pills to make people sleep is that there's never been a diagnosis established. Okay, well, maybe your child doesn't sleep or can't sleep without a pill. What is, what is, what's the name of that 
disorder i'd like to know maybe i need to know about i'm i'm in a constant state of learning i hope it never stops you know maybe i can learn something here but more often than not there's not been any kind of diagnosis it's again that expectation what i'm observing they're not matching up so i'm going to try to crowbar my child into something that works better for me yeah uh, i've never had a child ask for a sleep aid <laughs> you know what i'm saying like it, it just they're just kind of sitting there kind of trying to get the phone out of their mom's purse. Like that's what they're interested in at that point. They're not, you got to help me doc. Like I am really, I'm not learning my consonants and vowels because I'm not getting enough sleep. So I need, so it's just unfortunate that we have so little understanding of these things and, and, um, and, and that fear and anxiety that parents feel um, kind of gets washed out in terms of something. Oh, here, just give them this. Mm -hmm. Um, yeah. and so and no, I'm not very happening. medical, I'm not very medicinally inclined. Yeah. And, and I, I was struck by the statistic that was in your book, uh, that where you say that 20% of pediatricians have ever had any training in regarding the prescribing 20, 24, of I think, I mean, it's almost a quarter and even the ones that have, it's like a couple hours. I mean, I got <laughs> I went to Emory medical school and I was doing sleep research when I was an undergrad, but in my four years of medical school, we just got an hour long lecture. Right. And when you look at adults, it's <laughs> two of the top seven complaints of that all pa patients bring to their doctor is mm -hmm. can't sleep mm -hmm. and I'm tired or fatigued and there's pain and some other things or whatever. Mm -hmm. So it's interesting that in four years you get an hour for that. So I remember thinking, wow, I, I guess that's not something you maybe see a lot and, and that's all you see. So it's mm -hmm. really unfair that we're not arming people with that knowledge. And so that was a big reason why I wrote the book. I felt like, let's just go to the parents. They know more anyway. And, and, and so let's just inform them and let them be the advocate, you know, and if your mm -hmm. doctor kind of pushes back or gets upset because you know more about sleep than he does, then go find another doctor. I guess. <laughs> yeah. And you and don't know a lot about a lot of things. And yes. if your doctor doesn't not aware of that, maybe find another doctor. Yes. Um, and I, I think the, the critically important part of that quote was actually the second half of the statistic. We, we talked about, you know, a, a fifth to a quarter of, of pediatricians have had any training regarding prescribing of sleeping pills, and yet 66% routinely prescribe them. <laughs> yeah. So yeah. clearly, there's yeah, no, absolutely. Here. I mean, they've got seven minutes to spend with your kid to keep the yeah. lights on in the clinic. We, you and I could talk about sleep a long time, I imagine. And sometimes the parent and the sleep doctor need to talk a lot. I, I don't know your child yet. I know the average and I've seen some outliers in my career, but I've never met your child before. Yeah. So it's all about understanding and history and collecting good data and journals and, 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 and me listening and not me telling you what to do because the average child does this. And so if you don't have time to commit to it, that's okay. I don't fault pediatricians for the time piece. I fault them for taking it on and not just being like, oh, you just need to go see Chris <laughs> you know, or, or whomever. Yeah. Like, you know, just me, yeah. my God, there's much better sleep doctors where you live than I am. But it's just, let's just, that's what they want to do. That's what they're sitting there waiting to do. Yeah. So let's let the baby delivering doctors deliver the babies and the surgeons take out the tumors and the sleep doctors deal with the sleep problems. And, and I think everybody'd be a whole lot happier. Yeah. Okay. All right. So you've mentioned what a circadian rhythm is, but we didn't, we didn't really define it. Um, so I wonder if you can help us to understand what a circadian rhythm is and then uh, whether it's possible to shift those. Because I hear all the time from parents, you know, my circadian rhythm is this and my child's circadian rhythm is this, and the two are not well aligned. Right. What can we do about this? So circadian rhythm is essentially something in our brain that is a timekeeper. So if you think about a heart, a heart has a rhythm, uh, a menstrual cycle has a rhythm. Our bodies have lots of rhythms. Our, I say all the time, a brain never does anything accidentally. Like there's, you know, whether we can see the rhythm or not is different. And with sleep, it does provide a little window into that circadian rhythm. So what I always want people to understand is that circadian rhythm is not just related to sleep. It's related to the blood cell production in your marrow. It's related to uh, hormone release and digestive peptides and um, whether your left nostril is congested versus your right. There's even a circadian. I mean, everything has got a little pattern to it. Body temperature is a big one. Um, but the sleep's interesting because we see it. 
you know, we can say, oh, you know, mom is a real night owl and dad likes to go to bed at seven o'clock. And it, you can see that. Or um, if you're sitting up at night, you know, I'm sitting there in my underwear, my wife's like freezing because her, she's a, a morning person. I'm a night owl. And so her body temperatures dropped a little earlier than I, mine has. You know, if I'm staying up late cramming for an exam at two in the morning, that's when I start to get cold. So there's the drop. So there's little ways you can see it. Um, and it's really important because sleep is a great measure of that circadian rhythm. So everybody tends to be in about the same range, but there are people who just are more morning oriented and that that temperature drop might happen early. That's usually how you measure circadian rhythms in a study. You get a little you know, thermometer somewhere that's not terribly pleasant and you get it every 15 minutes and you can track it out. And now everybody's got thermometers with COVID. You can do it. Just take the little thermometer and read your thing and write it down and 15 minutes later, do it again. And the whole family can do it for a science fair project. And you can actually see that undulation. We tend to sort of peak around four in the afternoon and trough about an hour before we wake up. So it's important to understand those things because they govern things like when is your kid going to do best on a spelling test? When is he going to be athletically at his peak? When is he going to feel better? And if you're homeschooling, there's a lot of real positives to that. My wife's a teacher. Both my parents are school teachers. I think about once every six months during our child years, we would be like, we're homeschooling. Forget it. We're doing it. And, and, and there'd be so many advantages to that because then you could allow your child to have that bedtime when he wants to and the wake up time when he wants to that's you could create consistency it's just consistent over here so the question you ask can you change the circadian, circadian rhythm you can you're not really changing the rhythm so much as you're you're changing sort of the positioning on it meaning as soon as you stop rowing the current starts to take you back and anybody who's a night owl, you know, some guys in my neighborhood sometimes would get up and work out in the summertime. So I'd be a nice neighbor. I'm going to get up and work out with them. And as soon as the winter time comes and I stop, I go right back to wanting to sleep later, you know. So, so then the question becomes, what should you do? And, I, you know, I think the answer would probably be, oh, you should homeschool your kids. Um, and you're like, well, I'm not going to do that, or I can't do that, or I don't think that's the right thing for our family. Okay, so can we get your school to make some adjustments? Uh, no, we can't do that either. Okay, so you've got your night owl son is going to have to take, you know, AP calculus first period because there's no other option. You can't get it at the community college, couldn't take it online. There are things you can do. The problem is it requires a lot of a kid. Um, I mean, if you had told me when I was a college student, uh, Chris, you should probably go to bed at this time every day and get up and exercise and see some sunlight and eat breakfast. I mean, I would have just thought you were crazy. I, I, I have a memory from college of like coming home from something at 6 a.m. And seeing some, these, I remember these two guys got up, they were in fitness gear and they were going to the gym and I thought they were insane. I was like, what are they doing? Why would you even come to college if you're just going to get up at 6 a.m. and go work out? And then you realize you get older. Oh, yeah, they had, they were correct. You were really messing yourself up. <laughs> so to me, you can do it, but you've really got to have a bit of a participation uh, of, of that child. And I find that, again, you want to talk about mismanagement of expectation of parent and expectation of child really crashing it can be around some of these circadian disorders and just like we were talking about sleep need it runs in families you know mm -hmm. so if you're a night owl and your partner's a night owl just you might have a kid that's a real night owl and so if you're homeschooling that can be easy everybody gets to wake up or, or COVID mm -hmm. for some night owl families this has been I, hate, I always hate to say COVID's been a blessing that's terrible but that schedule relaxation of we don't have to get up for the bus. He doesn't have early bird, early bird jazz. His first class is at 10 o'clock on the computer. Mm -hmm. Man, he's making straight A's now. And then we don't have to get up to get him out the door. Like we have, you know, so there's different things for everybody, but you can do it. Um, it's just hard. It's really hard. Yeah. And and you describe the process in the book. And I, I read the rest of child first. And and frankly, <laughs> the process isn't that pretty. 
<laughs> it, it involves a lot of kind of uh, making your child do things that are not particularly pleasant to get them to stay awake so that they will, you can, you can figure out actually how much time do they really need to sleep and then figuring out what their wake time it has to be to get to AP Calc or whatever's going on in their lives. And then they can go to bed uh, before you know, then set number of hours before that. And the, I have to say the whole thing sounded incredibly mean spirited to me until I read your first book uh, in the sleep solution where you're essentially describing doing the same thing for for adults who want to shift their circadian rhythm um and so so the method is there but but with what you're saying about as soon as you stop the training as it were you're going to be swimming against the current i guess then my my question becomes well what happens if your kid is a night owl or or the opposite actually you're the night owl and your kid is a four o'clock in the morning kind of person and yes you can train them but do you want to be training your child for the rest of your life um do you just suck it up for a few years until they can learn to stay in bed i mean it seems as, as though essentially that's what you're saying right probably the thing you know hopefully as time passes those sort of extremes do soften mm -hmm. I, I would say yeah this is not a i'm deviating outside of science would say this to like my opinion would be yeah you'd probably if you're i mean i'm a real night owl fortunately my wife is not so it's a wonderful balance um but I do think, yeah, there's a certain degree of, of suck it up or my clinic starts at this time in the morning. I, I don't start my clinic at noon. So at some point, I think it was around medical school. It was kind of like, oh, you don't have to show up. You can sleep until noon if you want to. We're just going to kick you out. So, you know, at some point the motivation got there. Mm -hmm. um, but I don't know that it's necessarily the healthiest situation for me to be in. Mm -hmm. um, you know, I, this is definitely against my tendency. Mm -hmm. um, but so, yeah, I think that if you were the night owl and your kid were the morning person, yeah, or maybe you create a situation where, you know, you take turns with your partner or something where you could kind of make it such that it's not so bad. Um, but again, I, I think that getting the amount of sleep you need probably trumps that um, as long as things are consistent. And there's mm -hmm. lots of people who've kind of made their lives a little bit better. But it is interesting to follow people's careers because I do think that there's a lot of magazine writers who are night owls, computer programmers are night owls. Yeah. They gravitate towards jobs that facilitate that. I, mean, I always say to people all the time, my wife would have been a much better doctor than I am, <laughs> but her need for more sleep and an earlier schedule she became a teacher and i don't think that's entirely accidental yeah. you know and and that's and i think a lot of us saw really great people get weeded out of the process that were super smart but they just like i don't want to do i don't have the horsepower for that <laughs> which is probably they probably added years to their lives by doing that mm -hmm. yeah okay so and and what about night wakings then uh if if we're finding that as parents to be really detrimental to our ability and you you talk in in your first book about uh that it is not good for us to have these short periods of chopped up sleep and, and you cited your own sleep as a as a resident um, as an example of that so if we're essentially getting resident quality sleep <laughs> because our kids are waking our up QS. That's funny. That's right. Yeah. No, I mean, I think that's probably the biggest red flag in terms of sleep. Now, understanding that if you watch your child, like on a baby monitor, you're going to see that they awaken quite a bit, you know, wake up, move around, go right back to sleep. So we I think humans wake up about 30 times an average, a night on average, little arousals. Now, if you ask them, how was your night? They should say, it was fine. I didn't wake up at all, mm -hmm. which is not entirely true if you've got some little leads on their head. Yeah. Um, and kids can be really all over the place with that kind of thing. They wake up and reach for things that aren't there and sit up. And, you know, I remember another doctor saying, don't ever allow a parent to watch their child sleep because they do so many weird things that are kind of normal. They're not um, necessarily pathological, I should say. Um, but I do think that if you're feeling like my child's irritable, there are a lot of awakenings when they're coming into the bedroom with us. Um, or even not, like we just hear them awake in their bedroom a lot, messing around. They don't bother us, but we do feel like there's a lot of disruption to their sleep. Their bed's a mess in the morning and everything's torn up and they're turned around. They're sleeping on the floor. You know, I think that when you have those sort of indications that this doesn't seem like a really 
calm, peaceful night, th those are things to maybe bring up with the doctor, especially if they're associated with um, you know, bedwetting that's, that disappeared for a while and came back, um, low uh, growth that's falling off a curve. You know, they were always 80th percentile. Now they're kind of dropping off of that behavior and irritability that's new um, for older kids, you know, behaviors at school, uh, school performance problems. Like my child's always done well and seems to be struggling suddenly. Again, nothing wrong with struggling. Maybe the classes are just getting harder. But I think that you always want to pay attention to that because in my experience, really, really good parents do a pretty good job of ignoring that sometimes. I don't know. I'm, I'm bad at it. I, I ignore stuff wrong with my car. I was like, why is that? How long has the car been making that sound? Like, I don't know. Not too long. You know, I think it's going to work itself out. You know, <laughs> never works itself out. Right. Um, you know, so I think that we don't want to ignore those things away. But I think parents sometimes have a good reason to ignore it because they might bring it up with somebody like a doctor and then they just get kind of dismissed. Yeah, particularly you know, if they're wetting the bed again. Oh, well, that's OK. Kids wet the bed. Goodbye. You know, well, my kid's 14 now, you know, and he's still wetting the bed. Well, they're going to grow out of it. Like I just feel like a lot of times and it probably is coming from a place of I don't know what to do so I can either tell you I don't know what to do and I'm not sure about that I could send you somewhere or I could just dismiss you and unfortunately uh, choice C sometimes is the answer so don't feel that way you know if you feel like something's going on with your your kid I always tell people the worst thing that can happen is you get a sleep study that's normal mm -hmm. do, do you know what I mean like okay well, that's great i love a normal ekg even at my age like normal ekg all right that's great you know <laughs> thought i felt something there but maybe it was just the pork sandwich or something like, i'm so excited about that like normal studies are great um or they're not um so yeah I the, the fragmented sleep something to pay attention to and that's not just the kid wanting to come in and get a get another hug or sleep in bed mm -hmm. with you again that's your choice but if you're feeling like we can't get past the awakening, awakening, awakening all through the night. Yeah. Let's let's start digging a little deeper. Okay. All right. And then as we wrap up, then uh, for for parents who are on the newer end of parenthood, maybe maybe they uh, they're pregnant, they're expecting, uh, they have a newborn, they're like how do we get this started on the right foot? And I, I know there's not gonna be one recipe for this because every, every child is gonna have different needs, but what advice would you give to somebody who is very new to this process and who wants to get started in the best possible way that we can for yeah. an individual child? I think education is great. I mean, both of my books, and it's awesome that you read both my books. I just, just again, for your viewers to understand, and they probably get this from listening to you, we haven't been communicating that long and she's already gotten a hold of both of my books and clearly read them, which I just think is, I don't think my own mother has read both my books. That's, that's <laughs> really, really amazing of you. Uh, but, you know, I think that education is important. So in both of my books, I wanted to start off with at least some idea about how sleep works because it's amazing how some ideas people have about it. So that's where I would start off with understand that your child is going to be completely unique. So it's fine to have sort of a sense of, well, my best friend's daughter, this is the schedule that she used and it worked really well for her, or they really like this, how to get your kid to sleep through the night book. Uh, and I've been reading that too. Um, I, I think that one of the things that I find really interesting about that pre, the prenatal period is that if you're on a schedule, you know, you're going to the gym at the same time every day and have a little bit of a quiet time every day, then that could influence your child's rhythm once they're born. I mean, the only input they're getting right now is sort of sounds and movement from you. And so I think the more structured you can make your life with this amazing baby growing inside of you, probably the better your, your child will be. Now, that's not to say that if your life's all over the place, you can't rein it in in some way. But I would, I would also just be, you know, be confident because there's not a lot of things you can do to really wreck it. You know what I mean? If you're coming at it from a really good place, you know, again, that what method are you going, are we going to use for sleep training? I don't know. My husband wants to do cry it out. And I think that's terrible. Like just co again, common sense that you know, nobody wants their child in there screaming and wailing and turning like to you. So you're just comfort, give your child love, put your child's needs up there with your own. Don't have a lot of expectations initially. Like I think those first few months are just kind of survive it. Mm -hmm. 
Like, I don't have great advice for that. I call it gorilla sleep. Like, oh God, the kid fell asleep. You know, let's go take a nap. Like, you know, like you just kind of get through it, but just have a plan and understand that the plan's not going to work right off the bat. But, you know, I remember like our child's little nursery, we had a little light box on the table. And even when the child woke up at five and we wanted the child to wake up at six, you you go in there because they're kind of fussing and you sit with them and you're quiet and you don't get too crazy with them. And then at 6 a.m., we would open up the windows and change the diaper and turn on the light box right next to the child's head and, you know, play. And I'd put on some Bob Seger because my first child loved Bob Seger. That really little night move soothed her right now, you know, so whatever. Like, so there was this big state change at six o'clock, dark to light, fasted to fed, dirty diaper, clean diaper, dark light. And they got the situation, they got it down pretty quickly. I don't think it's because we were doing anything particularly exceptional and we just had a plan. And when the plan worked, that was great. When it didn't, you make some adjustments, but you're going to do fine. I'm, I'm jealous of the new parent for sure. It's so much fun. <laughs> it's the problems. Best seem easier <laughs> they seem insurmountable now but then when they get older they, they do like, <laughs> they do but they're just kind of they're problems that have less sort of consequence and mm-hmm. yeah you're tired and you feel afraid and you tell your kid he's an idiot but it, it's it's wonderful and it, it will work out and if it's not there's lots of people around that can help you out mm-hmm. I promise yeah. about that Okay, super. Well, thank you so much uh, for approaching me and asking to come on the show and for oh, bearing man. with me because when you, when you said that I wasn't sure I wanted to have you on the show, you weren't joking. <laughs> and you it's were true. very game about allowing me to uh, kind of poke a little bit about some of the things that you said in the book. And so I'm very grateful that you would allow me to do that. Um, and uh, yeah, I, I really enjoyed reading both books and I am implementing some of the ideas from The Sleep Solution, uh, your first book for adults. So um, I'm excited about that for me as well. So good, good. Um, well, I think it's so great. I'm going to talk about you from now on because every, whenever I say when our kids turn six or seven, we told them there's no bedtime. There's always like the audience is like, oh, scandal. I'm like, are you kidding me? I know somebody who started at three. Like, I can't even have like, basic language and they're like you no sleep like whenever you know like what i don't know i even convey that to it i love that good night moon we're gonna read good night moon whenever you want to good night moon whenever. well no that that's the, key. the stories still happen on schedule because that meets my needs right so we're it's Absolutely. not it's not a free-for-all but uh so <laughs> anyone who wants to read chris's books can find uh references to both of them uh the rested child is the the most recent one and then the, the sleep solution is the one that's geared towards adults all of that can be found at yourparentingmojo.com forward slash rested child 